I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. The Victorians laid the foundations of our modern cities, but they also created prison as we know it. Strangeways, Pentonville, Wormwood Scrubs, Dartmoor, and countless other prisons were built in the 19th century. I cannot begin to imagine what the conditions were like. Just like prisons today, this monumental institution dealt with everyone from white-collar fraudsters to drunks, vagrants, and violent offenders. He was obviously a, a hooligan, basically. Yes. It, it, well, it would appear so. It would appear so. And, and out of control, and with a vicious temper. The Victorians revolutionized the penal system. They introduced discipline, hard labor, and isolation to reform prisoners. He's managed to take himself from criminality to the height of respectability. But alongside this new regime were much older punishments like transportation and the death penalty. To know that a member of my family was sentenced to hanging, age 14. God, it's grim. Now reporter Daisy McAndrew and actress Michelle Collins learn just how rough this justice could be. He's basically trying to make a living. Mm. It's just so unfair, it's so unjust. And entertainer Len Goodman wants to find out if his ancestor makes good after five years of penal servitude. I can picture it, hundreds of men, full on labour. And the word in is perfect, hard labour. The Victorians applied their love of progress to prisons. They transformed filthy and chaotic jails into a centrally organized system, where all convicts receive the same regimented discipline and methodical punishments. By 1877, 90 prisons had been built or rebuilt. But while the system was evolving, other archaic punishments public hangings, transportation, and the debtor's prison were still in operation. Ever since the Middle Ages, anyone owing money could be thrown into prison by their creditors. In 1848, this is what happened to actress Michelle Collins' ancestor, Thomas Bright. Thomas Bright, umbrella fishing tackle maker, and lodging housekeeper in the debtor's prison for London and Middlesex. Hmm. Well, it does sound like something out of a Dickens novel. <laughs> Dickens' stories were shaped by the fact that his own father had spent time in a debtor's prison. London alone had 10 debtor's prisons. The debtor's entrance to the Clink prison on Stony Street gave us the expression, stony broke, for being skint. There were 30,000 debtors in prison the year Victoria came to the throne, from aristocrats to craftsmen like Thomas Bright. Thank you. Michel wants to find out what his life was like before debtors' prison. Hello, Michel. Really pleased to meet nice you. Meet you. Now, this is actually the street where your ancestor lived. It's today it's Monmouth Street, but back then it was Great St Andrews Street. No. And if you walk this way, I can show you the actual house where Thomas lived. So it's this one here, number 14. Miller Harris. Yes. I love Miller Harris products. I think I'll get discount. I think I you will for them. being um, family. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is gorgeous. Yeah. 
Did he live up here as well, or just had the shop? Um, he, li he did. He lived here as well uh, as uh, having his work workshop. That was very common. You, you, you lived on your premises. Most working manufacturing people did do that. Right. It's only sort of um, people who had a little bit more capital were able to do that thing of separate your workplace out from your domestic environment. Today, Seven Dials in London's Covent Garden is full of high-end shops and boutique hotels. But in the mid-19th century was much more down at heel. In fact, Thomas's umbrella-making workshop and family home was on the edge of one of the worst slums in London, the St Giles Rookery. Charles Dickens wrote about the area in Sketches by Bowles. Filth everywhere a gutter before the houses and a drain behind. Men and women in every variety of scanty and dirty apparel, lounging, scolding, drinking, smoking, squabbling, fighting and swearing. Oh, sounds like he's tender. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, considering there's all this going on yeah. in the streets, the, the sort of the squalor and the, yeah. and the um, you know, the, the Dickensian sort of lifestyle, you know, their life, seemingly seemed okay, but obviously this life then sort of caught up with them in a way. Absolutely right. Things got particularly bad in the 1840s. Uh, inflation was running amok. Mm. And you start to see a record level of insolvency and small businesses going to the wall. But in the days before personal bankruptcy, creditors showed no mercy. Debtors like 40-something Thomas could be thrown into prison without trial. Unlike debtors, criminals were tried before being sentenced. In 1862, Len Goodman's ancestor Henry was found guilty of assaulting his father at the Old Bailey and sentenced to five years penal servitude. Henry endured nine months of solitary confinement before being moved to a remote prison on the Dorset coast, Portland. Now a young offenders institute, Len wants to find out what Portland was like when Henry was there. It's just one of the toughest places to come to Portland to, to, to do, serve your time and do hard labour. Yeah, I would have thought so. Portland's a pretty tough prison. I think it's uh, really hard labour here, quarrying the stone. Yeah, but at least he had the chance to earn his ticket out of there. Because yeah. you could earn early release if you go through what was called the mark system. Oh, so they could get off if they, if they kept their nose clean, as we say, and yep. uh, worked hard. And... Yeah, in the Victorian period, life doesn't mean life, and five years doesn't mean five years. Then, as now, prisoners were released early to prevent overcrowding. The Victorians also knew they couldn't run prisons by the rod alone. They used the carrot of early release to encourage good behaviour amongst convicts. General record of conduct and gratuities. That's it. So basically, you, you work your way through various stages from probationary class, third, second, first, special class, and you earn your way into a different class by hard labour. And if he progresses through the stages satisfactorily, he earns enough marks, he'll be let out early and he can be rehabilitated back into society. Yeah. And that's what the prison was supposed yeah. to do. You were supposed to go in a criminal and come out a better, a better obviously, that's the, I guess the job of all prisons is to make you come out a better person. That's right. I and mean, if you look, I mean, Henry is doing, he's doing pretty well, really. He's yeah, he's, got a, few, he's got a few nines there. Yeah. Right, oh, he got a three one week. That three, maybe he was ill, couldn't work that day. Don't earn any marks if you're ill. No, no labour, no marks. Right. But prisoners also lost marks for breaking the strict prison rules. Uh-oh. Record of prison offences. Oh, God. Here we go. Yeah. Fighting yep. on the works. Yep. Shouting at fellow prisoner. Foul language. Yeah. yeah. He gets uh, marks knocked off. 84. 84. So that's... that's pretty much 10 or 11 days labour. Yeah. Really. And here he gets put in a dark cell. Three days, bread and water. and water. In a dark cell. The 
punishment was physical and sensory deprivation to make prisoners change their ways. They don't bear thinking about. One thing's for sure, mm. after five years of this sort of conditions, you're not going to hurry back if, if you've got any sense whatsoever. The conditions in those prisons was atrocious. Yeah, yeah, no. To get out early, Henry would have to earn his freedom through sheer hard work. Hard labour was a key part of Victorian prisons, but it came to Britain via an older punishment. Transportation. From the 17th century, Britain sent criminals to work in her colonies. First, America, and then Australia. Among them was reporter Daisy McAndrew's ancestor, Mary, who was transported in 1792. Part of my sort of childhood stories that we were always told you know, when we were little is, oh, you know, mum's criminal background, ha, ha, ha. You know, it was a bit of a joke. And the point being that one of mum's ancestors was sent from England to Sydney to you know, Botany Bay on a convict ship. Um, and the story went that she was a teenager who'd stolen a horse um, and been convicted of it. Like many orphan girls from poor backgrounds, Daisy's ancestor, Mary, had to find work as a servant when her grandmother died. Unhappy in her situation, she ran away, disguised as a boy. When caught on someone else's horse, 14-year-old Mary gave the name James Borrow. Sarah, Thomas, Jane, Anne, James... Ah! James Borrow? Yep, that's him. So James Borrow, a.k.a. Mary. Mary, so he, we believe, is a she, feloniously stealing bay, as in bay? One bay, One bay mare. mare. Ten, mm. ten pounds. So it was stealing a horse. So the family, yep. yeah, the the family, family myth, story for once. Was, it's quite rare for family myths to be true. Right. And at ten quid, which is a third of the value of an, a labourer's annual wages... This is a that's, serious yeah, nag. That's the equivalent, <laughs> modern equivalent of at least ten, twelve thousand pounds. And so she was found guilty of that, she, he. But she has a problem because horse stealing is a capital crime. Capital punishment had long been used as a deterrent. And by the late 18th century, there were over 200 crimes that could be punished by death. Laws were made by wealthy property owners, so stealing anything from a horse to a handkerchief could get you hanged. So. Yeah. My five times great grandmother stood in this spot, watching him put the black cap on, knowing that only means one thing, and thinking, I'm a 13, 14 year old girl dressed in boys' clothes and I'm going to be hanged. I mean, I've always been passionately anti capital punishment anyway, but to know that a member of my family was sentenced to hanging, age 14. God, it's grim. At this point, she'd have been returned to uh, the jail and would then await whether she was actually going to be hanged or not. So she'd be in this awful suspense. God. But we know she wasn't hanged. She was changing the subject <laughs> quickly because I'm here. If she had been yeah. hanged, she wouldn't be my five times great grandmother and I wouldn't be standing next to you here. But the alternative, transportation, was seen by many at the time as a fate worse than death. By the mid-Victorian era, 168,000 criminals had been transported to the other side of the world. But at the end of the 18th century, Australia was still an unknown territory. Hardly an established place at all. We're talking about uh, somewhere that's really on the f mental frontier of the, of the Western world. So that must have been uh, something that struck fear into the hearts of people here. It must have been still a very severe sentence. Mary may have been saved from the hangman's noose, but in the eyes of her family, she was still doomed. Some of her relatives decide to produce a petition to get her off the transportation as well. And this is the petition. Mary Haydock, a girl only 14 years of age, underlined. 
Your petitioners therefore most humbly pray that your majesty will extend to her your royal pardon and forgiveness so that she may not be doomed to a miserable exile. Wow. Mary's youth may have kept her from hanging, but as the age of consent was only 12, she was legally a woman and so perfect breeding material to help colonize Australia. Let's have a look at the judge's report. It is more advantageous for the prisoner to be made a public example of. I am humbly of opinion from the artful manner with which she conducted herself. Well, artful wasn't a, artful good, is, a good word, uh, is it? As an artful dodger, yeah, not, not good. An artful sort of like... Deceitful. Sneaky. That's she should be transported. And at this point, therefore, she's just stuck in jail. Uh, she's going to have to wait there until she's transported. Transportation was a key part of the penal system up until the 1850s. Had Len's ancestor Henry been tried for GBH 10 years earlier, he too could have been sent to Australia. Instead, from 1863, Henry did hard labor, quarrying Portland stone. The raw material for some of the British Empire's most beautiful buildings. Is it all by hand, more or less, or is there machinery? That... No, it's all by hand. It's all convict labour. So you can oh. see here. This is... Oh, yeah, this is amazing. I can picture it. Hundreds of men working away, chiselling away, just full-on labour. And, and the wording is perfect. Hard labour. And that's what it was. Every day they're here, apart from Sundays, where yeah. they have religious instruction, and they will labour here for eight hours a day to earn those marks that we talked yeah. about earlier. It must be days when they were so felt desolate and well, I mean, not deserted. Hot, baking hot days, it must have been a vision of hell in this place, mustn't yeah. it? Just hundreds of men toiling away. And in the winter, you know, cold, frosty, yep. hands are frozen, and yep. you're trying to work with a chisel. Oh, horrendous. Many convicts were broken by this dangerous work. Illness and injuries were rife. In just one of the years that Henry was at Portland, there were 282 accidents. Hard labor, hard fare, hard board. Summed up the deliberate attempt to make prison a formidable institution in the 1860s. Attitudes had changed from the early 19th century when penal reformers had been horrified by conditions in the old jails, like the one Daisy's ancestor was held in prior to transportation in 1792. In the dungeon for male felons, I saw 52 chained down, so physically. Mm, they have irons yeah. and they're chained probably to the, to the building. Hardly 14 inches being allowed to each. Moisture from their breath ran down the walls. He says, I need not intimate the heat and offensiveness of this dungeon. The women were in irons as well. He says, last year, seven of the felons died in their dungeon of jail fever. It's a, a totally neglectful environment. This is an environment that's based on profit. You're not concerned, as the 19th century prison was, to isolate people. This is just a holding pen run by an entrepreneur and it's the pains of neglect, really, that's deliberately neglectful. These pre-Victorian prisons were privately run, and with commercial enterprise came corruption. The whole prison is based on the exploitation by the jailer of the prisoners, and of the prisoners by the prisoners. Do you know what this is? Garnish? Yeah. When you arrive in the prison, uh, the fellow prisoners demand garnish, and if you don't have a shilling garnish, they sell your clothes and you end up naked. And presumably that's the boys and the girls. I'm, I'm guessing Mary didn't have a garnish to... No, well, she might well have lost some of her clothing then, because that was what they did. She must have been absolutely terrified, even if she was quite a, a wayward girl. I can imagine it as a sort of a real Sodom and Gomorrah kind of, kind of environment. She must have been a really different person when she got on that ship than she'd been a year before. 
These old corrupt ways were being eradicated in the new convict prisons of the 19th century. But reform of debtors' prisons lagged behind. Even as late as 1848, when Michel's ancestor Thomas Bright was thrown into Whitecross Street prison by his creditors, the extortion of money or garnish was still rife. Garnish was a payment on Whitecross Street that would have been about a pound, which is another pound that poor Thomas has to pay. So how would he have some money to...? Well, he'd, he'd need to have it, because if you didn't pay, they taunted you and bullied you until you paid. So you're getting yourself in more debt, yeah, even yeah, in debtors' yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, very difficult system. Yeah. And he's costing his family rather than earning for his oh. family. Debtors' prison was a draconian penalty for people who had not committed crimes, but merely owed money. So this is where he probably would have been. Mm -hmm. God, it looks like an old workhouse, mm -hmm. doesn't it? How many um, people to a... Cell, a cell, or a they're room. not in cells. And in fact, no, we can see like a, if we have a look. So it's almost like an open prison it is. equivalent of today. Yeah. And they're actually referred often at the time as open prisons. And this is because people during the day come in and out of the prison. It doesn't, of course, mean that Thomas could have left, mm, but no. other people could yeah. come in. They might bring in blankets, they might bring in food, they might bring in news, bring him clean clothes mm. um, to make his life a little bit uh, less despondent. Imagine if you had that in Dessa's prison now. Yeah. Yeah, how many people would be in it? They'd be very busy, it? wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Sometimes whole families went into debtors' prisons, but more often they were daily visitors, like Thomas's children and his wife, Susanna. And this book describes the conditions, the social life of the prison. The area is filled with men and women, many of them honest and all unfortunate. No one here but has a sad tale to tell. The world has gone wrong with all of them. That's so sad. Their wives and sisters perhaps come to see them daily, bringing with them always some few words of intelligence from the world without. The dear women have evidently dressed themselves in their best and brightest attire, that they may look more cheerful than they are. The men look, for the most part, stricken and woebegone. Their dress is neglected, their clothes disorderly and ill put on. So I think that says it very neatly, doesn't oh, it? Oh, that's awful. Yeah. That's horrible. I suppose like people now, you know, you can't keep on top of things. You get into a mm -hmm. bit of debt and it just escalates, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It, it mm -hmm. just, you just get yourself into a real mess. Yeah. yeah. There are men in Whitecross Street, when Thomas is there, who have been there for years. So I need to know really what did happen to him and, and whether he did get out. Yeah. yeah. And there's no guarantee that he will. Under the modern criminal justice system, nearly all prisoners are freed after serving half their sentence. This system of early release is often criticized, but it's nothing new. Back in the Victorian era, even serious offenders doing long prison terms were released before their sentence had expired. Len's ancestor Henry was trying to earn premature discharge from his long penal stretch in the quarries of Portland. He, he must have been longing for that time when, when, he, when he'd done his sentence and, and they said, OK, you, you know, it's time for you to get out of here. Well, let's, uh, let's have a look at something which will tell you a little bit more about that. Oh, right, now, yeah. old Jaws is here. Her Majesty is graciously pleased to grant to Henry Blackall. Oh, this is, this is his release. This is freedom for Henry. This, oh, well done, Henry. Well done. Cool, I bet he was happy. So basically, with this licence in his hands, it saves him from another nine months in this back-breaking right. work. Well, well done to him for for at least not have, you know, being good enough to not have to do the whole five years. Yeah. But Henry would be sent back to serve the rest of his sentence if he didn't stick to a strict set of rules. Don't mix with criminals. Keep your nose clean and be a good boy. So if he breaches any of these regulations... Back he goes for another nine months that's to it. finish it all off. That's it. 
In the convict prisons, inmates were released when their sentence was up. But for debtors imprisoned indefinitely, there was no respite and little justice. Ten years into Queen Victoria's reign, there were still 10,000 debtors in prison. And Michelle's ancestor, umbrella maker Thomas Bright, was one of them. That imprisonment could have continued for months and months and months and months and even years. Oh, so I thought once you did your time, that was it? No, no, oh. no. Their imprisonment was purely for the safe custody of their body. So by imprisoning Thomas Bright, his creditors were stopping him from doing a flit, effectively, from running away from his debt. So he would still be expected to find that money from somewhere? Yeah. yeah. But how if you're inside and you well, can't do anything? This is precisely the problem with imprisonment for debt. You have to be in your shop mm. in order to sell things, in order to get out of debt. So it is like, yeah, catch-22. There is no system. You're, you're totally up against the system. So you think so that time you spend in prison is completely useless. It's, it's terrible. He's been, you know, it's a, like, he's a victim of his yeah, yeah. Um, circumstances, of being working class, really. And also the word prison. You think of prison as being a place for people who have committed a crime. It's not a crime. He's basically trying to make a living. It's just so unfair, it's so unjust. For Thomas, getting out of prison was to become even more pressing. Hey, oh, they had another child, Edmund. The child is born in December. Thomas files his petition in, in August. August. So at that stage, he'll know that, that his, his wife, wife is, is having pregnant. a baby. Yeah. Oh, must have been so awful for her. Mm. Can't even imagine. By the mid-19th century, many social commentators thought that imprisonment for debt was so futile that transportation would be preferable. But when convicts were first sent to Australia in the late 18th century, the five-month journey was perilous. Male convicts were shackled below decks, but conditions for women weren't much better. Those who survived to reach Sydney Harbour were often weakened by scurvy, dysentery and fever. Daisy McAndrew wants to know how her ancestor Mary coped with being sent to the other side of the world at the age of 15. Do we know anything about what her trip was like or what, what sort of state she was in when she arrived? Or Well, as a matter of fact, we do, because she did something pretty special. She sat down and wrote a letter. You're kidding. Just before she got off the ship. Wow. Here that's it is. amazing. And there you are. This is her oh my goodness, that's actually her yes. handwriting. Yes. My dear aunt, I write this on board of ship, but it looks a pleasant place. I am well and hearty, as ever I was in my so life. So there you are. <laughs> I'm well and hearty. We shall but have four pairs of trousers to make, so she's going to be making oh, garments mm. a week. I must conclude because we are in a hurry to go on shore. Mm, that's that's right. thrilling. So she's escaped all those horrors that are possible and real on ships. Yeah. When the men and women were taken ashore, the irons around their ankles were knocked off. You know, we weren't, people weren't in chains in, in early Sydney. Uh, Sydney yeah. is not actually a jail. It's actually a, an exiled colony. It's a penal experiment uh, devised by the British government as a way of emptying out the jails. Yeah. After their sentence was finished, then they would be receiving land, free land. And if you can imagine that for a working class person in England, it's quite incredible. Well, exactly. I mean, that bit of it doesn't sound so severe. The irony that convicted criminals were freer in Australia than innocent debtors were in Britain was not lost on the Victorians. Having witnessed his own father's plight in a debtor's prison, one outspoken campaigner for penal reform was Charles Dickens. Michel is meeting his three times great-granddaughter, writer and historian Lucinda Hawksley at one of London's legal centres, Lincoln's Inn. Dickens himself had to deal with the fact that not only his father, but his mother and all the younger siblings went into the Marshall Sea with John Dickens. They all lived in the prison? Yeah, it was fairly common at the time. They couldn't afford to pay his rent in prison and their rent outside. 
Um, unlike Thomas, whose children were too young, mm. Charles was 12, and so he was deemed old enough to earn money for the family. Um, the young Charles Dickens probably thought his father was never going to come out of prison. What happened was that when John's mother died, she left a small legacy, and that legacy enabled him to come out of the prison. Thomas Bright had no such benefactor, so his only chance of release was to appeal to the Court of Relief for insolvent debtors here at Lincoln's Inn. Thomas had to prove his debt was caused by misfortune and wasn't fraudulent. So he's just here at the top. Right. Uh, adjudication of the court and when made, 6 November. Actual discharge when to take place. Uh, oh, so what does that mean? Dis forth means discharged forthwith, which means he came out of prison. Oh, so he, he got off? Yes. Um, well, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing, isn't it? Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, he's not, I mean, He's obviously not in prison anymore, but he's suddenly out and he's got to still find the money for the debt. Yes, they would have seized any property that could any be sold. assets. Mm -hmm. mm. And one hopes they were left with perhaps a bed for his pregnant wife. Mm. But other things would have been seized and what they would have probably said is, you need to pay X amount each month or each quarter. Um, and he will then, with Susanna, who will have just had a baby, mm. have to be earning enough. So it's certainly not over. No. I mean, it's terrible, isn't it, to think that <laughs> You think you go, you know, you, you do your time in a prison and then you suddenly come out and it's, it's almost just as bad as it, as it could possibly be. It was an incredibly unfair system. The laws were really made for the rich and the poor often fell through the net. No. It's about keeping the working classes down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Once released from prison, neither debtors nor ex-cons received any aftercare. Most went back to their families and the same conditions that got them into trouble in the first place. In the case of Len's ancestor, Henry Blackhall, this was back to an area of London's East End called the Old Nickel, which in the 1860s was an infamous slum. Len wants to find out if Henry managed to stay out of trouble after his early release. So here's a document that um, might give you a clue as to what happened to Henry. Oh, let's have a look. Is he on here? Mm. There he is. Oh, ho, 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 ho. He's 23, yeah. single. Please don't say that that says licence revoked. Does that say licence revoked? It does, Len, yes. Oh, he's a stupid boy. So he's done something that has uh, broken his conditions mm. um, and, and they've stuck him back in. It looks like they've stuck him back in again, yeah. This, oh, what? Oh, this no. is the register for Millbank Prison. So they put him back in Millbank. Do you know what he did? We don't know what, exactly what it was that he did, um, but the terms of the licence are very strict. So it's quite easy for him to fall back into this. Well, you say that, but it's also very easy not to if you just keep yourself law-abiding. I can understand you being quite hard on him, but yeah. Henry's problem is coming back into uh, a, a notorious area of London. There's about 6,000 people living in a very small area where there was a tremendous amount of criminality. Right. Uh, just one of the streets. There are 64 people who had had a previous prison conviction. So the idea that he could avoid... Bumping into criminals, well, you can't. It's impossible. Because every other, every other bloke probably has had a criminal record. Yeah. With little hope of finding work, and with the police breathing down his neck, Henry would face an uphill struggle to rebuild his life. Over the course of the 19th century, the Victorians transformed the criminal justice system. They abolished public hangings in 1868 and imprisonment for debt in 1869. But it was 21 years too late for Michel's ancestor, umbrella maker Thomas Bright. To free himself from debtor's prison, he had to sell all his stock and the tools of his trade. 
for six years, he doesn't appear in any of the trades directories. So it seems that he lost everything financially. So he lost the shop? Yes, lost everything. But we have here what's called a trades directory. And you would have had to have paid to be in this. So he's earning enough that he can afford to advertise again. So if you look oh. down here. There he is. Thomas Bright, umbrella maker. Little yeah. St Andrews Street, Seven yes. Dials. So he's, oh, so he's in the same area, same but just area another street point. around the side. Yes, absolutely. Oh, so. well, that's good, but at least we know he didn't go back in prison. Yes, he was quite incredible, really, the way that he, he managed to start again. We also have another trades directory, which is this one from 1861. Oh. So we've gone on a few years. He's down here, Thomas Bright. 21 Cumberland Row, Upper Street. So, Basically, that was here. We're now in Camden Passage, but this is the area that Thomas was in. So he's really started to make his way back up that ladder again. Wow. Mm. I'm really pleased to know that he got himself back on his feet again. He really did get himself back on his feet because this is a much more salubrious area. Spurred on by the spectre of the debtor's prison, Thomas and his family worked hard. His wife, Susanna, continued to toil as a seamstress, and his daughter, Amelia, Michelle's three times great-grandmother, also inherited his Victorian work ethic. This is from 20 years later. So you're not going to see Thomas this time, but you are going to see um, another name, if you look towards the bottom, that you should recognise. See Amelia. Can... Yeah, well done. Well, wow. Amelia is an umbrella maker. Yes. She's taken on her father's oh, profession. that's so nice. Makes you want to cry. Isn't that fantastic? Now, here you see there's another address that we've come to now. 51 Baldwin Gardens. Mm. And that was actually in Hoburn. Geographically, it's really not very far from St Giles, but is an absolute world away from where Susanna and Thomas were living when you first began your journey looking into them. It's such a different world. It just makes me feel really proud, actually. It makes me feel really proud to, to, to be working class and, and to, yeah. to know, you know, how he suffered and what he did and how supportive and how much he cared for his family and how important they were to him. In the new world, convicts could use this same work ethic to build a new life. Transported for stealing a horse in 1792, Daisy's ancestor Mary founded a trading empire with her husband Thomas Raby, a free settler. After Thomas died, Mary continued expanding the business and built this very house for her family. It is a tingly thing to think that I'm sitting where she might have sat with her cup of tea or whatever was her tipple and looking out on her, on her domain and thinking back onto her incredible mm. life. Mm. And at the age of 44, Mary went on an extraordinary journey. Have a bit of a read of that. So is this her handwriting? Yes. It's impossible to describe the sensation yes. I felt when amongst my relatives and on entering my once grandmother's house and to find it nearly the same as when I left nearly 29 years ago. She, she's saying that she went home. Absolutely. She actually managed to get back to England and so many ex-convicts wanted to go and they couldn't, uh, and let alone the women. Very, very few women got back. But Mary had an ulterior motive with her visit to England. Attitudes towards convicts in Australia were toughening, and Mary didn't want her criminal past to jeopardise her family's future. She's worrying about the stigma that is going to be attached to her right through the generations. Now, I know you've seen a lot of documents, but I'm going to show you one that is one of the most important documents in Mary's life. Seriously? Mm. It's the 1828 census. I think, although it's not clear, that looks like Mary's name there. Yes, Mary, that's right. 50 years old. What yes. Is, what's this? It looks like CH, but I don't know if that's... It's actually CF. Oh, and, CF. And what it means is, I came free. Oh, so she's fibbing? It, absolutely, she's fibbing. And that's the year she arrived, that's which was she says, 30 yes. years after she actually yes. had arrived. Yes. So she went home to visit? 
and yeah. then came back here and then pretended that that was the first time yes. that she'd been here. Oh, she's always been sneaky, hasn't she? <laughs> it's like the original judge said when he called her artful. What a story, what a woman. Mary's various businesses and charity work earned her a special place in Australian history. She is now commemorated on the $20 note. To have that as part of my family legacy, and no matter how tiny it is, to have some of her DNA or to have some of her genetics in me is an incredible honour and something that I can tell my daughter about and say, look what Mary did. There are no boundaries in your life. There is nothing you can't overcome. It's fantastic. But as Mary's life was coming to an end in 1855, so was transportation. As the Victorian era progressed, reformers in Britain and Australia campaigned to abolish this punishment, and the last convict ship landed in Australia in 1868. Just a year before, Len's ancestor had earned early release from his five-year sentence for assaulting his father, but Henry was imprisoned again when his licence was revoked. I think poor old Henry Blackall had no chance, really, from, from birth almost. He's, he's come out of prison and unlike um, in the modern system, there's no aftercare service for him, there's no probation service to look after mm. to Henry or to guide him along the straight and narrow. He's left to his own devices yeah. completely. And this is eventually what people begin to realise towards the very end of the century, which is why we have a probation and aftercare service. Yeah. By the end of the 19th century, Victorian reformers realised that education and reintegration were essential to reduce reoffending rates. Probation officers were employed to help stop ex-cons falling back into their old ways. But Henry had no support. So he's gone back in. Done his time. Done his nine months. Do we know anything else after that? We've managed to find a document that, that hopefully explains what happened to oh, Henry right. after that. So what is this exactly? Well, a patient. Is this a, is this a hospital? This is oh. the records of the London Fever Hospital. Oh, God, there he is. 27. Yeah, let me look. Yeah. Cured. Uncured, died. Oh, don't but did. He died. Afraid he did, yeah. Oh, Henry. Bless his heart. He's only twenty he's only twenty-seven. That is an absolute shame. I guess it, it's constitution from from working outdoors in those quarries and so on, you know. His body's been, in many ways, broken by the prison experience. Yeah. Lack of proper food and nourishment, you know, so you're not, you're not robust, really. His immune system shot to pieces. Henry probably succumbed to scarlet fever, a disease that was rife in Victorian slums. But perhaps there are some positives to be drawn from this, this, this quite bleak record. If we look at where he's living. Nichols Row, number eight. Is that, that's his dad's house. Ah, so he's made up with his dad. Yeah. At the very end, he's had some reconciliation with his family. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad he got back with his dad, though. I'm glad of that. Good old Earth Henry. At the end of the 19th century, the old nickel slum was torn down in a bid to regenerate the area. I feel so terrible for Henry. I re it, 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 it's as though everything conspired against him. And, and I'm sure that Henry's story could be mirrored hundreds of times. Everyone was against th those people. You know, society was against them. They weren't nurturing them and trying to make their lives better. They were just trying to kick them down more and more. 
And you know, how can you survive all that? It's impossible. Over a century later, the social causes of crime still exist and debates about criminal justice rumble on. Prisons are overcrowded and reoffending rates just as high. Even with probation and welfare services, 47% of adult prisoners are reconvicted within a year of release. Many people think prison doesn't work, but we have yet to find an alternative to the system invented by the Victorians. And while Victorian prison buildings are being replaced, the legacy of the inmates who did time inside lives on.